I really just tackle one thing in this particular uh, set of notes, and that is how we account for the varying vantage points and the recollections of the four Gospels when they're not identical. And the scholars have a, a term that covers a lot of this issue. They call it the synoptic problem. <clears throat> how do we account for the differences and the similarities in the synoptic account? And uh, it's not a problem if you think what the Gospels testify to happened. If you think it happened, then the way that uh, people accounted for it through the centuries, because believe me, ancient people weren't stupid. The way they accounted for uh, the similarities and differences was on the analogy of what happens with any human event when d various people report it. Whether informally or formally, people remember different things and people report different things. Uh, I was struck full force by this once reading a Stephen Ambrose account of the Normandy invasion. And he talked about how, um, <clears throat> how botched it was on Omaha Beach because all of the bombs that fell, fell about five miles inland. So none of the gun emplacements on the cliffs in Omaha Beach had been taken out. And um, if you saw, what was the movie on that? That there was a Saving Private Ryan. Sa Saving Private Ryan was a you know you really get some kind of an impression of the carnage because of these guns. And the only thing that saved the day was uh, the improvisation of Navy destroyers. And there was no script or plan for this, but they came in until they were beaching in the sand and they turned broadside. And of course, they had you know, massive stores of ammunition that were supposed to last them for months. They used all the ammunition in the ship that day, shooting four-inch guns, which were very small guns by comparison with you know, big battleship guns, but shooting them right into the cliffs. And the concussion and the shock eventually demoralized all the machine gun people who were concreted into these cliffs. But, you know, uh, officers on the ship kept logs. And Ambrose was reading these logs. And in one log, the guy, might have been an admiral, was just saying, the day's lost. The invasion is a failure. We didn't plan for this. This isn't going to work. Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and he's totally, like, writing off the whole thing. And right next to him, watching the same things, there's another officer, and he's saying, this is genius, this is going to work, we're going to break through. You know, and and the, it's the same time, same place, same fighting force, same everything, same, same evidence, but two totally different assessments of what was going on at that time. Now, if you read those two logs, would you say, nothing happened that day. <laughs> these accounts disagree. <laughs> or would you say, uh, these are two very different vantage points that have similarities, but they also have mark differences, and that's the way human recollection of similar events is. So um, John Wenham, who's now with the Lord, was a great English scholar, a New Testament scholar, a gospel scholar, and he did the service of putting his university level, you know, Oxford University learning to the service of trying to account for the Differences in the Resurrection Accounts, and he wrote up a, a book. It's, it's written at a popular level, so I'm sure you could get it, you know, you go on Amazon, probably get it for five bucks or something. Easter Enigma, do the Resurrection Accounts contradict one another? And you can read these paragraphs for yourself, and, and he talks about the approach of, uh, you could say, critics, and how they insist on a reading that makes it impossible to see the Gospels as complementing each other. In other words, they, they force them to contradict each other because of the way they say you have to read them. And he says, well, let's read them in a different way. And if you read the last paragraph, he calls this the harmonistic approach. He says it enables one to ponder long and conscientiously over every detail of the narrative, 
and see how one account illuminates and modifies another. Uh, that's what you said last night, Pastor, uh, that, that you know, helps the Gospels to come together when we see that they're telling the same story from different vantage points. And a lot of times we even see that they bridge between each other unintentionally and they complement what, what each other says. Gradually, without fudging, because there are a lot of questions we can't answer from the evidence we have in the Gospels, people and events take shape and grow in solidity, and the scene comes to life in one's mind. Such study is beautifully constructive and helps to vindicate the presuppositions on which it is based. That is, these things happened in some facsimile of the way they're reported. It is sad and strange when immense learning leads to little knowledge of the person studied. This kind of goes back to our marveling a while ago. How can people study all this and not believe it? That's what he's lamenting here. And then I've highlighted this. It's not highlighted in his book, but I wanted to highlight it for you. One thing is certain. Jesus was a concrete, complex, and fascinating figure of history. And any method of study which fails to reveal him as such is working on the wrong lines. So that's just a commendation of reading the Gospels, even though they have different vantage points. And, and in that respect, you could say, they contradict each other. This one says there's one angel. This one says there's two angels. This one says there's one blind man begging. This one says there's two blind men begging. You get these kinds of discrep these discrepancies, and that's what his book is about. How do we handle these discrepancies when it comes to, you know, the 38% the of Mark, that's the passion narrative, and culminating in Easter. So I, uh, I highly recommend this book just because I think it's a, it's a very meticulous method. Uh, he's not going to you know, come up with shoddy answers and, or avoid problems, but I think he does a very good job of modeling uh, a very observant and learned and reverent approach to things that uh, we all do well to know more about. Now, how about Jesus' divinity, moving us closer to uh, our actual time relative to our schedule? Uh, John is the ego gospel in Revelation 4. As I said before, John most explicitly, most repeatedly, stresses Jesus' divinity. And in the history of scholarship, beginning in the 19th century in Germany, because Mark is the shortest and for other reasons, Mark was, was said to be a gospel that really downplays Jesus' divinity. Um, and, and it was the favorite gospel of what came to be called in Germany the liberal movement. Because they felt they could read John, they, they could not read John without being hit in the face all the time by, by claims of Jesus' divinity. But they felt they could read Mark and they could see it just as sort of a human testimony to an ethical teacher and not to some son of God come from heaven. However, when you read Mark, you are confronted first with Mark 1, 1 through 15, John the Baptist's testimony. And that harks back to Malachi 4. And I would look, like to look at Malachi 4, just to remind us. Um, this is a, pro a prophetic proclamation. The day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord. Remember Moses, verse 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. This helps explain the intense curiosity of the people about John the Baptist and also the authorities in Jerusalem about John the Baptist. Because they all knew there was this prophecy that before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Elijah was going to reappear. And some thought that meant a reincarnated Elijah, and others thought, no, it will be somebody Elijah-like. 
And when you studied the Gospels, remember when Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? They said, well, some say Elijah. Because he was proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he was proclaiming the day of the Lord. And, you know, that's saying the end of the world is at hand and everybody's going to be judged. I mean, everybody should be interested in that, and they were. John the Baptist says this day has arrived, and Mark's gospel says he's preparing the way of the Lord referring to Jesus. In other words, in, in Malachi, the Lord is Yahweh. The Lord is God, the creator God, the God of Israel. He's not Jesus because Malachi doesn't know about Jesus. But John the Baptist comes preparing the way for Jesus, who's also Yahweh. You can't separate the two. So just the way that Malachi is fulfilled in John the Baptist's coming and the fact that New Testament writers sort of conflate Yahweh with Jesus. The Lord, the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord. Jesus is the one who fulfills that, not just as a prophet, but as somebody who is also called the Son of God. He has a, re a u unique relationship with God the Father. This is an attestation of his divinity. We see uh, Jesus' divinity affirmed at his baptism. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And uh, the commission that he receives there. Jesus' authority over evil. Who has power over the devil's sin and death? Well, only God, but Jesus exercises that authority. Number four, Jesus heals. Jesus forgives sins. And they even say, who can forgive sins? But God alone, Jesus forgives sins. Who instituted the Sabbath? Well, God did. God himself rested on the seventh day. Uh, he made a provision for his people Israel to rest on the seventh day. And that was one of the pillars of Judaism in the time of Jesus. Sabbath and the Sabbath observances. And, and of course, they had made a lot of regulations to help people to honor the Sabbath. Uh, they saw those traditions as just as important as the actual biblical teaching. Jesus even said, you are making your traditions more important than what Scripture says. But Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. You know, that's a claim to be sitting in God's seat of judgment. And they didn't appreciate that, and they understood that, uh, you know, this is a uh, this is an implicit claim to divine stature. Number five, his acknowledgement by evil spirits. They called him the Holy One of God. And they saw a presence of God in him that could only be explained by the mystery of his divinity. Number six, Jesus' power to raise the dead which he exercised. Number seven, his preeminence over nature. When Jesus stills the storm, you can't help if you're a student of the Old Testament, but think of Psalm 107. And if you go in Psalm 107 down to verse 23, you see why in some of the gospel accounts, when Jesus stills the storm, there are a couple of responses. One is um, they rejoice, and I think it's because they're not dead. It's like the miracle on the Hudson. But in another account, I think Matthew's account, they're terrified. After the sea is calm, it says they're terrified. They say, who is this? That even the wind and the waves, wind and the sea, obey him. Well, in the psalm, it describes people going out on the sea in ships. And this is Psalm 107, 24. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. He spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. Imagine being on a little boat with the sea going up and down. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. 
Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Remember the disciples cry out to Jesus, Save us, Lord, don't you care? We're about to die. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. And so forth. No, no Jew could fail to see the similarity between this account of God and his power over the wind and the waves and what had just happened to them in this boat. And you got to remember in Deuteronomy 4, there's a very clear prohibition. It's in connection with uh, uh, you shall not make for yourselves uh, any idol. There's a very clear prohibition of conceiving of God, making a God out of any human figure, male or female. This is one of the ways that, um, I've got a book on, I think, seven Christologies written by a Jewish rabbi, and this is the point at which he attacks um, historic Christian understanding of Jesus. He says it's obvious that this is, uh, you know, a blasphemous, the Trinity or Jesus' divinity, it's a blasphemous conception because Moses forbids viewing God in the form of a human being. And of course, what he isn't acknowledging is we don't say that Jesus was God the Father. We say that Jesus was God the Son. And that's not denying Jesus' godness, but it is affirming that God's oneness is three in its nature. So you have God the Father, Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, what the disciples couldn't understand is how a human being could be embodying prerogatives that belonged only to God. And so he's not just teaching. It's not just some, like, blackboard thing, you know, where he's explaining, I, you know, my divinity. This is the hard currency of, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than a coincidence if you say, peace be still, and the wind stops. And that's pretty good timing. And then the other thing is, and I, I'm not a seaman, but I know enough to know that you, you have storm swells for hours and hours after a wind stops. And the way the Gospels depict it is that not only did the wind cease, but immediately it was calm. And some of these guys were seamen. They were fishermen. And that would have just been spooky. Because it can't, I mean, it's one thing for the wind to stop. And then, I mean, there would be a natural process. But that's not how it's, re it's presented, that immediately the waves were gone. You, how do you dispel storm swell? There's, there's millions of tons of water sloshing around, and all of a sudden, it's, it's not doing that anymore. So, um, I, I'm just, I'm cherry-picking Mark's gospel here, and just pointing out some of the clues to Jesus' identity that make it as inescapable that he came as the Son of God, as in John's Gospel, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is, was with God in the beginning. I mean, that's, that's blatant. But this is no less blatant. This is no less blatant, if you know Yahweh as he's presented in the Psalms. Number eight, Jesus teaching about the Lord. Whom David acknowledged. Let's look at that one. Uh, Mark chapter 12. Thirty-five through thirty-seven. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under put your enemies under your feet. David calls him Lord. How can he be his son? How can he be both things? And the crowd listened to him with delight because he was he was uh, proposing questions that the doctors of the law couldn't answer. But the answer here is that uh, Jesus, in his oneness with the Father, is both the God whom uh, David recognized 
but the Messiah figure who was God, who came to deliver world redemption, and who came as a descendant of the house of David. So he was the son of David, according to the flesh, but he was divine as to his eternal identity uh, and his heavenly origin. And then uh, number nine, Jesus' attestation under oath. Now for background here, we have to remind ourselves of this eerie scene in the book of Daniel where God is on his throne and Daniel has a vision. He says, in my vision at night I looked and there was before me one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So this, this is an eerie Old Testament image of the Ancient of Days is, is Yahweh. He's God the Father. And it's kind of a throne image through the, you know, the fog and the, the mists and so forth. There's the Ancient of Days and someone who's human-like. He's led into his presence and this human-like son of man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That resonates with uh, promises made to the household of David. But remember, all, especially this uh, coming with the clouds of heaven. The son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Now Jesus preached about a coming son of man. And that, that was an ambiguous reference because a lot of his preaching would have been done in Aramaic, and the son of man in Aramaic just meant a person. So there were times when he talked about the son of man that people wouldn't have thought he was talking about himself. He's just talking about somebody in general or maybe some other person, not himself. And then uh, Ezekiel especially gets called son of man a lot by God. And so son of man could also designate somebody with uh, a special authority from God. But then there is the possibility, which I, you know would have been blasphemous, the possibility of someone being the Danielic son of man. The son of man presented in Daniel. And Jesus is on trial. And uh, they keep making charges, and uh, basically he lets them rave on. But in Mark 14, 61, where it says he remained silent and gave no answer, again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And in Mark 14, 62, Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. You know, that can only mean that in Jesus' self-understanding and his confession to the priest, he is the Danielic son of man. And uh, you, you can't get uh, really a more uh, blatant affirmation of divinity on the part of somebody than that. And I think the next verse, let's look at the next verse. Uh, the right response is to tear your robe. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? <laughs> you know, this guy is a false prophet. This guy is an imposter. Look, it's Jesus. Some guy from Galilee. Or some guy from Nazareth. Uh, he's running around claiming to be the son of man in Daniel. We've got to put a stop to this. So uh, I think we've probably covered enough for this session, and I hope you're uh, convinced that Mark's gospel presents a divine Jesus, so that we, when we do get to uh, Mark chapter 10 and the beginning of that last week of Jesus' life, it's not just a great prophet that's going to the cross. 
uh, in the mystery of God's promise and God's working, it's God himself. Emmanuel. God with us. Who uh, interacts and continues to teach and eventually lays down his life for the sheep. Thank you and enjoy your break. <laughs>